Okay, we are now recording Zoom session. Here we go. And we're going to be covering now, our, we're going into digital hearing aids per se. So let me close that calendar down. We don't need to look at that. Here we are. Our notes for today, digital hearing aids, channels, feedback reduction, compression, and expansion. We may or may not get all through this today. doesn't matter. I gather next week is fall, is, uh, fall break. So anybody listening to this Zoom session, next week, Wednesday, there is no class, just so we know. I'll be grading midterms that you are now presently doing, and I'll slowly crank those out and get, get those back out to you on Canvas as the days go by. Well, anyway, today we're looking at digital hearing aids, and we're leaving the topic of compression by itself. We're leaving that alone now. We're now we're concentrating on more of the features that are actually found in today's digital hearing aids. And to, as it says here, to appreciate digital hearing aids, we've got to understand their analog forebears. Well, analog hearing aids had one type of compression or another. They were either WDRC or they were output limiting. And so clinicians had to know which one. They had to know their compression. They had to know which compression to order in order to choose the right hearing aid. So that's why I always say the 90s was like the golden age of compression. Today, we don't understand compression quite as well anymore because the digital software does it all for us. At any rate, digital hearing aids began as digital imitations of their previous analog hearing aids. Even the multi-channel and programmability of the high-end analog hearing aids that we covered two weeks ago, those were imitated in the first digital hearing aids. Today's digital hearing aids combine all sorts of compression types together in one hearing aid. All aspects of these compression types can be adjusted by the fitting software knee points, ratios, but the complexity of any one digital hearing aid today is now sickeningly overwhelming, and that's why you need to have the software to do it, and the software does a lot of it for you. So many adjustments are possible in each and every channel. It's impossible for clinicians to know how to adjust them all for the hearing loss, so the software, therefore, has become king. Off-bounds parameters are now prevented by the software. You can't do certain things because the software will says, no, that's insane. <laughs> but it's really funny. Here I'm highlighting this sentence here because I think it's hilarious. Psychosocial aspects and answers to kinds of questions now determine settings. It's almost like this. And I'll stop sharing for a second. It's, it's kind of funny. It's like... Do you have, does your client have trouble hearing the preacher at a 35 degree angle at a 45 foot distance every second Sunday? If so, push this button. It's getting, it's almost insane. It's like the, the and listening situations. You can just ask your client, where do you have difficulty? And then you can actually put that in the software and the software will kind of answer your questions like that for you, which I think is like, or it'll, it'll set the hearing aid according to, to, to what your little needs are like that. Do you uh, have troubles uh, hearing at the, at, the, at the library every Saturday um, at nine o'clock? It's, it's funny. I just think it's hilarious. Sometimes the software is, uh, is it's rather humorous. Let's look at actual digital hearing aids. Check this out. I want to make sure, too, that I have the right one. This is the wrong PowerPoint. So let's pull up the correct PowerPoint. Here we go. And let's pull up this slide here so we can just take a look at it closely. This is the first slide in your PowerPoint for this particular unit. And I think this is unit five we are in. Now, <clears throat> had a nasty cold over the weekend. Okay. The top is showing you analog hearing aid. The bottom is showing you a digital hearing aid. And you're just looking at a schematic. Now, I wish this top thing would go away. Always, there you go. Go away. Now, analog, oh, there it comes back again. Analog and digital hearing aid circuits. Now, here's your input. Here's your mic. And a mic is just a transducer. It changes energy from one form to another. 
So the mic changes sound waves into electricity, and that's what you can see right here. Acoustic has now changed into electrical. And then, they, then that, that electricity was amplified. The battery supplied electricity, that, therefore the amplifier could increase the electrical current. So now look at this electrical current is larger. And then the receiver, which is a backward mic, the receiver is a speaker, it changes electricity into acoustic energy again. So you had sound changed into electricity, and electricity changed back into sound. Analog. Analog hearing aids are all hardware. You have a mic, an amp, and a receiver. Hardware. And that's why in the old days, ANSI measurements were so highlighted because ANSI measurements test the hardware of a hearing aid. They test harmonic distortion, equivalent input noise, reference test gain, output sound pressure level with 90 coming in, all of that crap is hardware. But look at the bottom now. Now we're talking digital. There's nothing digital about the mic. A mic is still a mic. A mic is analog. It changes sound into electricity. But now look at here. You have an A to D converter, analog to digital. So now you're changing electricity into digits. And look at the center, DSP, digital signal processing. Well, that's where the digits are manipulated. This is where all the math is done, right in the center, DSP. And you'll look at the bottom, binary, 0, 1, 0, 1. It's all these combinations. And I always say, at, at, you can get with math, you can get anything you want at Alice's Restaurant. Okay? You can, you can manipulate the formula, the digits, any which way you choose. So look at the transductions taking place here. Look at the changes. You have sound into electricity, just like the analog. Now the A to D changes the electricity into digits. The digits are manipulated, and now you have a D to A converter. Digits are changed back into analog, which is now electricity again. And now the receiver, which is the same as it is in analog hearing aids. There's nothing digital about the receiver. Now the receiver changes the sound, the electricity back into sound. So here's the, here's the summary of this slide. Analog changes sound into electricity. The electricity is amplified, and the electricity is changed back into sound. Amplified sound. Notice how this sound is bigger than the one on the left. Digital. Sound is changed into electricity. The electricity is changed into digits. The digits are manipulated, and then the digits are changed back into electricity, and now the electricity is changed back into sound. You have one more step taking place here. If we look at our notes here and, 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 and just take a peek at what the notes themselves say, let's look at analog and digital. Look at these words so that we can kind of make sense out of this. Analog versus digital. We're going to just kind of take these words and we'll make them make a little bit more sense. Where did they get the word analog? And now I'll stop sharing so that we can just explain. When you think of the word analog, it looks like the word analogous. The same it means analogous. Make an, 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 an analogy to this. Make, some, make a story about it as if it's you know, a similar thing. Well, remember turntables with records? And now they're coming back again. All the audio files are back into turntables again. For a while, it was all CDs, digital. But look at turntables with records in the old days. You want to come to my house and spin some platters? <laughs> That's what they said in the 40s and 50s. Let's spin some platters. Don't sit under the apple tree with anybody else but me. <laughs> so you got a record turning, and you have a needle. And the needle on the arm of the record player is in is in is in the grooves of the record as the record is going around. This needle is tracking. And the record, if you look at it closely with a magnifying glass, you'll see that the grooves have little tiny wiggles in them. Well, those wiggles make the needle wiggle. And the needle wiggles are changed into electricity. And guess what? The electricity is exactly analogous to the wiggles. The particular
molecular wiggles that are taking place in the plastic are transferred to the needle, and the needle is making now electrical current that's analogous. The electrical current looks exactly like the wiggles in the needle. That current is amplified, and then the speaker, the woofer and tweeter of your speakers, are moving analogously, exactly, to the motion of that electricity. So everything is preserved. Everything is analogous. That's analog. That's what analog means. Digital goes one step further. Digital takes sound and it, and it, and it, and it changes it to, into electricity. But now the electricity is changed into math. And as soon as you've got math, it's no longer analog. Here's why. Now I'll, st I'll, stop sh I'll, I'll start sharing again, and we'll look at a picture as to why that's the case. Look at this. Here's a picture of sampling and quantization. Here's a sound wave. Take a look at the red on the left. It's a sound wave. One cycle. It's just woo. So time is on the horizontal. Amplitude is on the vertical. Now. Analog takes the whole red sound wave. Look at this. The whole red sound wave. Digital doesn't. Digital samples. So it takes a sample here, a sample here, a sample here, here, here. So it's, it's not taking the whole sound wave. It's taking samples of the sound wave over time. And guess what? It's assigning a value to each sample that's taken. So if you look at the screen here, this first one here on the left, it's going to assign it 0.2. And the next one, well, it's kind of in the middle. It's going to maybe, it's going to have to dither a bit. It might pick 0.4, it might pick 0.6. And the next one, and the next one, each of these samples are quantized. And quantization means a numerical value is assigned to each sample. So now when you look at the wave on the right, if you see the red wave on the right here, look at the red, that's analog. But the digital implementation of that analog wave is the white little stair steps. You see that? And that's why, that's why the audio files, that's why the people today, the purists, who really are turning back into listening to turntables on records again, this is why they're doing that. They're going, you know what? Digital is missing some stuff. Look at what the white is missing. It's not capturing all of the analog signal anymore. Uh-uh. It's got samples that have been quantized. And sampling means taking all these blue lines, sample, 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 and you're taking that sample and you're assigning it a value. So there's a sample, there's one, there's one, there's one. And what I mean by quantized is you're giving a number to that sample. You're giving a number to that sample. You're giving a number. And the number you're giving is these values on the vertical axis here. So here's your quantized and sampled sound wave in white, whereas the pure sound wave itself is in red. That's the, the difference. Okay, so when you will go back to the notes now and read with it, what, what does it say? Analog, current is a continuous imitation of the sound waves. And put a star by that. That's what analog means. Okay, the electrical current is a continuous imitation of the sound wave. It is analogous to the sound waves. The sound is changed into electricity. The electricity is amplified. But remember, it's, a, it's analogous to the sound waves, and the electricity is changed back into sound. So the electrical current looks just like the sound waves, and then that electrical current that looks just like the sound waves is moving the, the speakers analogously, exactly in the same pattern as the electrical current. Everything is analogous. The electrical current is analogous to the sound waves that come into the aid. And the digital, the, the, the receiver, the speaker, in, in keeping with that, is also moving analogously to the electrical current. Digital, uh-uh. Now you've got discrete representations of the sound. By discrete, I mean this. Discrete, look at the white here. Discrete representations of the sound. 
Okay? That's the difference. Sound is changed into electricity. Electricity is changed into digits. The digits are manipulated, and the digits are now back, changed back into electricity, and that electricity is now changed back into sound. In digital hearing aids, the center of the universe is right here at that DSP. That's the center. Everything is taking place in that digital signal processing unit. Know what A to D means and D to A. Analog to digital converter, digital to analog converter. Okay? That's essentially as much as I would ever ask anybody to know. <coughs> Sampling rate, quantization, don't worry so much about those. We're not becoming engineers. <coughs> I was mainly just sort of telling you a bit of a story. But I'm never going to ask on any exam, tell me about the sampling rate and tell me about the quantization. I really couldn't care less. doesn't matter. Okay. Now, what do all of today's digital hearing aids have in common? Well, first of all, they've got lots of bands or channels. Lots. The original Widex, the first digital hearing aid, 1997, had three. Three channels. So each, each, each of these channels was kind of wide. If you think of a frequency response, and I'll stop sharing here for a second, if you think of a frequency response as being kind of like, and I'll write this here. Yeah, I'm just drawing you a picture here. So if you think of a frequency response, I wonder if that's visible, if I can even see that guy. Yeah, okay. right. Okay, so you got frequency, you got decibels. So look at how wide each of those channels is. You know, fairly wide. I mean, if this is going to be 125 hertz and that's going to be about 8,000 hertz, you know, you got pretty wide channels. It's like three big sort of blop and blop, and you know, you got three wide fingers. Okay. So is that for like your lows, your mediums, and your highs? Correct. Yeah, and that you could for? raise, you could raise or adjust those as you liked. To accommodate the the client's hearing loss, so if we if we start looking at our at the PowerPoint slide uh, that would represent this today, look at how many channels or bands you'll have on hearing aids. And this is just a fictitious example. This is just an example. Okay, instead of having three, you might have like fifteen. Some of them have twenty-five. And that means that, see how narrow the channels have become all of a sudden? If you see my cursor here, the channels become really narrow. And so the more channels you have, of course, the more fine frequency flexibility. There's three Fs for you. Fine frequency flexibility for you. <laughs> and so now if you look in red here at the bottom right, you can see how the frequency response is literally sculpted, literally can be shaped to anything you want, okay? And that it makes today's digital hearing aids extremely flexible, is having all these channels. And that's why we no longer talk about two-channel digital hearing aids. The, the, the analog hearing aids ended, or you know, ended, the analog era ended with two-channel bill and till hearing aids, okay? Digital began with the wide X Senso having three channels. And now today, multi-channels is, is, is the way uh, that they all have gone. They all have lots and lots and lots of channels. Sometimes, oh gosh, I think the this, this Adro hearing aid sold at Sam's Club, I think they talk about it having 94 channels. I mean, it's just insane. So each of your channels is really, really skinny, but it provides infinite fitting flexibility. Okay, so if we look back at our notes here, the Oticon Digifocus was the second digital hearing aid, the second horse to leave the barn, okay, 1997 as well. It had seven channels, so it had more channels than, than, than the wide X Senso. <clears throat> and they called them bands. And bands means frequency, and then you can group the, the bands into groups, and those are called channels, okay? That's what they did. So, so why did <clears throat> the Oticon Digifocus, I'll draw you a picture of that. The Oticon Digifocus had 
seven of these guys. So I'm going to draw three here like this and then another three or another four like this. And then they called these channel one and they called these channel two. So here we go. I'm going to draw frequency again on the bottom. DB again here. Okay, stop sharing. Have a look. See, this is just the best way I can convey it. Okay, so it had seven bands, and then the lower three bands were called channel one, and the upper four bands were called channel two. And guess what? It did bill. It did, you know, they focused on base increase at low levels. They provided linear gain for the high frequency channels, and they used base WDRC confined to the base for the low frequency channels, based on good old Oticon philosophy. That's their thing. That was their their hat and they, or their, their hook, and they hung their hat on it. Okay, then came Siemens Prisma. I think that was hearing aid number three. It had four bands or channels. And then Resound came out with 14. <laughs> so all kinds of permutations abound today. Bands versus channels, if you read with me in industry convention, in digital hearing aid, a channel is a band if only the gain is adjustable. But often, much more is adjustable. Oftentimes, in any one of these bands, you can adjust digital noise reduction. You can adjust the feedback reduction. All kinds of stuff can be adjusted. And so now, if you can adjust more than just the gain in one of these bands, it's called a channel. Don't worry about it. Nobody's worried about it. Next. Bands, channels, I call them almost the same thing. But to be technical, Bands means just the frequencies adjustable. A channel means usually a group of bands, like Oticon did, where more than just the gain is adjustable, where the compression is adjustable, where the feedback reduction is adjustable. And so that's why that, 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 that was the definition of band versus channel. Channel just mean, meaning a group of bands where more than just the gain is adjustable. Now look at this one up the top of page two here. Bernafon. Now, Bernafon had what they called a channel-free hearing aid. Yeah, channel-free. It's the only digital hearing aid company that came out with what they call channel-free. And they made this hearing aid imitate one-channel analog hearing aids. They didn't want to divide everything up into different channels. Okay, they didn't want to do this kind of a thing. They said, oh, if we do this, we're going to get a lot of distortion happening because you're breaking up your input signal and you're dividing it over seven different regions. And you're going to run into trouble if you do that. I'll go into PowerPoint and I'll show you the picture that we've got in PowerPoint here. I'll show you the same thing. They'll be saying, hey, if you do this, if you break up the sound into 14 or 15 of these little bands or channels, you're going to invite the devil to come in. You're going to invite distortion. You're going to have trouble between adjacent frequency bands. The neighbors aren't going to be happy with each other. This little finger is going to fight with this one. This one's going to fight with this one. You're going to invite distortion. So Bernafon's philosophy, their, their belief, their religion was, let's keep the hearing aid digital, but let's not break it up into, into little divisions. Let's just have it. One big channel, and you can adjust the bass or the treble in that channel, just like you could with analog hearing aids. But we're going to just keep on, we're going to focus on not making everything multi-channel. Don't break everything up. Leave everything whole. Keep things holistic. And, and adjust bass and treble just like the way we did with analog hearing aids. It'll be a digital hearing aid, but we're going to just <clears throat> focus on updating its frequency response over time. Every split second in time, we're going to update the frequency response. We're going to focus on the time domain. We're not going to focus so much on the frequency domain. 
enough on that. It's just to let you know that such a hearing aid existed at one time, and it still does. Bernafon still does make channel-free hearing aids. It's just a philosophy, and I want you to have heard of it. You're kind of scratching your head going, what the heck is that? All right? If we read here, feedback reduction. Now, feedback reduction is another feature. So one big feature of digital hearing aids is lots of channels, or as they'd say down south, buku channels, like lots, okay? Except for Bernafon, channel free. A second thing that's big in digital hearing aids today is feedback reduction. Now let's describe feedback and make sure that we understand what feedback really is. You're talking in a mic, and then you move too close to the speaker. Let's say you're talking in a room into a microphone, and you walk up to the speaker. All of a sudden, you get that squeal. You got to back away from the speaker. How come? The reason is because not only my voice is coming into the mic, but now the amplified sound from the speaker is coming into the mic. Um, that's a mistake. Now we got a problem, Houston. Okay? Because not only my voice is coming into the mic, but the amplified sound from the speaker is coming into the mic. Now you've got a loop. Okay? You've made a vicious circle. That's feedback. Mm -hmm. And in hearing aids, it's the same thing. You're wearing a little tiny hearing aid in your ear, and the mic is picking up sound, and the sound is amplified. It's sending it down the, your ear canal. The amplified sound is hitting your eardrum. It's bouncing off the drum. It's leaking out the vent, and it's getting picked up by the mic. So the amplified sound is getting picked up by the mic. So yeah. can, can yeah. a, a lay person hear, hear that? Because I, there was a lady in front of us at church a while back, uh -huh. and her hearing aid was squeaking. I could hear it squealing. I'm like... Oh, that's her hearing aid. It's got to be annoying. And she was older, and it, it, I don't know if she couldn't hear no, it. No, you know what? why she couldn't hear it? Because she's got a high-frequency hearing loss. Oh, my. I could, I could you know, I'm like, that's well, Of course. Hearing. Yeah. Feedback is more annoying to other people than it is to the person wearing the hearing aid. <laughs> okay. And a lot of times, the person wearing the hearing aid can't hear it because he or she has high-frequency hearing loss. So they, they, they don't hear a thing. They don't even know it's doing it, huh? Oh, no, no. Everybody's tapping the person. Oh, okay, your hearing aid uh, is going nuts. But that's what feedback is. It's least amplified sound is being re-amplified. Okay? It's, it's bouncing. Out, it's leaking out of the vent, and it's getting picked up by the mic. Amplified. Bouncing off the drum, leaking out the vent, amplified by the mic. You've got a vicious cycle happening. So think of feedback in a hearing aid exactly like feedback in an auditorium when you walk too close to the speaker. Same thing. So how do they get rid of it? How do they get rid of feedback? Many mid to high end analog hearing aids or digital hearing aids have automatic feedback reduction. Very common. It's almost it's found in almost all digital hearing aids today. Reduces the need for actual physical filters, as in analog hearing aids used to use. Now, how can should we describe this? I think I've got a picture of it, so let's check this out. Here is feedback reduction. So have a look at this slide. Here's your frequency response in a hearing aid, and it's just a fictitious frequency response. Here it is. Here's your output. You've got less bass, more treble, because more people have trouble hearing treble. So most of the amplification is, of course, in the treble. And this is out of a digital hearing aid, okay? Could be an analog hearing aid, could be any hearing aid. Feedback is caused by peaks in the frequency response. Peaks, okay? If this frequency response was smooth, it wouldn't be causing feedback. It's usually high frequency peaks, okay? And so what you wanna do is, is, you, is the bottom. You wanna get rid of the peak. So here's that little peak sticking up in the air, and, and the other peaks aren't so big. It's this top one here that's gotta get rid of. So that what they do is they get rid of it. Now, 
here's all the channels. Here's the center frequency. So this is a, a multi-channel hearing aid. Here's your little fingers, your little individual frequency regions that can be raised or lowered by the software to accommodate the shape of the person's audiogram. And here's the, here's the feedback reduction taking place. Now, in the old days, how did they get rid of feedback? Well, in the old days, you had to reduce your high frequency gain. To get rid of this peak, you had to reduce your gain. And in the old days, hearing aids had only two channels. And so when you reduced your high frequency gain, well, shucks, you did this. Or I can't figure out what's hot, what's, what faces you. You, you, you had to reduce that. Well, now you're doing what you didn't want to do. You're supposed to be amplifying the high frequencies because the guy has high frequency hearing loss. But you're trying to get rid of the feedback. So you're reducing your high frequency gain. Well, now you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater. So the old riddle was, I turn the hearing aid up to here and it whistles. I turn it down to stop the whistle and I can't hear. So what that you, you as a clinician have to figure out how to get rid of the high frequency peak in the frequency response. One way to do it was to provide filters. Now filters were little screens, just like my fingers like this, little tiny screens. And they were put into the ear hook of a BTE just right before the tubing went down into the mold, or they were put just in front of the receiver of an ITE. Took out the ITE, look at the receiver, and you'd see a little, little tiny screen in front. And filters cause resistance. Now, if you remember way back in your acoustics, when you took acoustics course, we said impedance is opposition due to mass, opposition due to stiffness, and also resistance. And you add those three things together, you've got impedance. And we said impedance is like a frown, and an upside down frown is a smile. And what's the smile? Resonance. What isn't impeded resonates. And what doesn't resonate is impeded. Every object has its mass and its stiffness and blah, 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 blah. Well, filters, these screens, act as resistors and so what they do is they block they take peaks out of the frequency response wherever the peaks may be so when you put a filter in it reduced this peak it took that peak out it took this peak out it just made things smooth that helped that was a good solution in analog hearing aids to fight feedback. It better that than turning down the whole gain of the highs, way better than, you know, than doing that. But today we have other possibilities. Today we mess around with better things. So we have, first of all, they call it a static notch filter. They'll just put a filter digitally right over top of this channel here. They'll just kind of put it like a notch filter. They'll just kind of, okay, we're just going to cut out that frequency. Every time we're just going to reduce, in other words, it's just a reduction of the gain of that channel. It's not a physical filter. It's not a screen. They're digitally doing it. Okay, they're digitally putting in a mathematical command to knock out this frequency by a few decibels. That's called a static notch filter, but remember it's done mathematically. Then you had roving notch filters. Roving, hmm, that's even better. Roving notch filters were, were moved. They moved. So wherever the peak, if you had a high frequency peak and it was happening over to the left here, the notch filter would move to the left and knock it out. So the hearing aid was digitally programmed to detect wherever there's a high frequency peak, go over there and, and, and put out that fire. Wherever there's another one. Oh, speaking of fires in California. Wasn't that awful? Oh, man. Yikes. Yeah. Got some weird troubles happening in this world, eh? Yeah, that's it, it's awful. You know, that's an area, you know, I lived in for 56 years. So, Gosh. Um, you know, uh, even up where we lived, I saw a thing from our church, and oh. there's fires up there, which we've had bad ones up there before. And, oh, my. Awesome. Santa Rosa yep. is 
just devastated. We used to, we've got, Kim and I have gone there. We've gone to Santa Rosa before. Yeah, it is just devastated. Oh, yeah. Yikes. Yeah. So, uh, and of course, the week before it was Las Vegas. Man, oh, man. I know. I mean, gee, many crickets. And then hurricanes, uh, you know, the, yeah. between the hurricanes the and the earthquakes in Mexico. The, Isn't that weird? I it's know. Little, it's just like, wow. You wonder if revelations is, is, is going to happen. Yikes. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> I know it. So here we go. You roving notch filters try to find the peaks and they, try, they go there and stamp it out. Okay. Now, not remember feedback is a high frequency phenomenon okay it's not going to knock out peaks in the lows and let's look back to acoustics to understand why that is the case here we go remember back in 110 in acoustics low frequencies bend highs bounce lows bend highs bounce so the highs bounce to cause the the feedback. feedback and the, the lows would bend and they just simply okay. don't act that way they yeah. don't bounce off the eardrum look at it this way how long is a 250 hertz tone wavelength the speed of sound over the frequency so you do the speed of sound 340 meters per second divided by 250 you're going to get like 1.4 you're going to get like 1.4 yards long you're going to get a four and a half foot long sound wave that's 250 hertz, four and a half feet long. 125, nine feet long. Okay, now go up. 500 hertz is it going to be about half of four and a half, so about two and a quarter feet. 2,000 hertz, about one foot. Okay, 4,000 hertz, about six inches. 8,000 hertz, about three inches. So the shorter the sound wave, the more it's likely it is to bounce off of things because the sound wave isn't long enough to bend around things. That's oh. why lows tend to bounce, or to bend, because they're long enough to go around things. That's why foghorns on boats are low frequency. Because you want the sound to go around islands and around lighthouses you want that sound going all over the place you don't make a high frequency foghorn <laughs> it's not going to work okay so high frequencies bend bounce and that's why highs cause feedback and that's it. it's just a it's just some simple physics to keep in mind it's just something anyway feedback reduction the third way to prevent feedback reduction is mainly what's used today phase cancellation. Your hearing aid detects at what frequency the feedback is taking place. And then get this, the hearing aid produces that frequency in opposite phase. So now the feedback is canceled. Canceled out. Phase cancellation. Feedback peak is detected and then reverted into an opposite phase. It's done at the microphone stage, a powerful tool, but it requires more battery power. But it's an interesting thing, phase cancellation. It says the hearing aid is actually producing an opposite phase, so it detects the frequency of the feedback, and then it makes an opposite phase sound and knocks it out. Well, it requires a bit of battery uh, operation happening, okay? Okay, so that's today's feedback reduction, and I will be honest with you. I'll be frank with you, but surely, let's be frank. Now, uh, feedback reduction, the challenge for it is always not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. So even as clinicians today, even with our digital hearing aids today, when you are programming a digital hearing aid, especially for a high frequency loss, be careful about applying too much feedback reduction. It's best if you don't have to use it at all. Try not to use it. If you have to use it because you, you're, you're, you put your hand here, and that's how you can test too. Because the, the leaking sound, if you stand by a fridge, it's going to bounce off the fridge and it's going to cause feedback. Okay. Same with when you're testing a, a hearing aid and you got it in your hand. 
okay, how do you how do you test if the hearing aid's working okay? Now let's see if I I think I've even got a hearing aid here. Here we go. So I got me a little hearing aid here, and I want to test if this guy's feeding back, or I want to test if it works. I'll put it in my hand, and I'll ee ee. As soon as I cut my hand around it, I'm causing feedback. Eee. Why? Because now my fingers are acting like little walls for the sound to bounce off of, and it's aggravating the feedback. And that's how you, that's how you troubleshoot a hearing aid. You want to be able to whistle. My sister-in-law, she wears two CIC hearing aids, completely in canal hearing aids. And she's going, yeah, Ted, I think, I think my right ear is getting worse. I can't quite hear as well in that right ear anymore. I probably should get a test. I have a, I said, well, let me see the hearing aids. And they were the same. I said, was your hearing levels the same in both ears? Yeah, they were when I got the hearing aids. That's what the audiologist said. The hearing, aid, hearing was similar in both ears. So the hearing aids are similar. Well, one was a blue one for the left ear. One was red for the right ear. I took them and I took the, the, the blue one because it's the left ear. And I went, ee, ee. okay, that one works. We put it down. Right ear aid, mm -mm, it's not doing anything. Did you change the battery? Yep, it's a brand new battery. Okay, look at the receiver. It's plugged with wax. Get a pin or a toothpick, knock the wax out, put it in my hand. Eee, good, now it works. You want the feedback. You, that's how you troubleshoot a hearing aid. You, you aggravate it and you make it get feedback and then you go, okay, at least it's working. But if you apply too much the automatic feedback reduction, you are, get, you are suffering a lack of high frequency gain. So be careful. Some hearing aid companies are better than other hearing aid companies at digital feedback reduction. Oticon has had trouble with it. Resound has a very good feedback reduction. Now Oticon is catching up. They're learning, so they're, they've improved theirs. So, but feedback reduction is an issue. And it can become an issue if it's used too liberally, too, oh, yeah, let's, let's apply that right away. And it's like, well, oh, be careful. Try not to use it because otherwise you lose high frequency gain, and that's, uh, that gets to be a bummer. So, all right. So does the fitting method at all, does fitting <coughs> method as far as, you know, using the, the open canal fitting and, and that kind of stuff, does that affect feedback? The, the what, fitting what method? Kind of yeah, the fitting method as far as, you know. Well, not, not no. really. Not right. because the fitting method is going to, the fitting method is looking at a certain target gain that you want, right? It's looking at the target output, the target gain that you want. So you've binked in the hearing loss into NOAA, and then you've chosen what hearing aid manufacturer you want, and then you've chosen the make and model, the model of the hearing aid. So let's say you've chosen an Oticon. Okay, now I want an Oticon Open, OPN. Yep, that's the hearing aid I want. And you've programmed the guy's hearing loss into the hearing aid, and then you, you, you choose your fitting method. Now, DSL, whatever, flip a coin, and you choose now, let's say. And now is going to prescribe a certain target output, and it's going to program the hearing aid to match that target. You're going to hit save, okay? And then hopefully, when you put it in the guy's ear, it's not whistling all the time. And if it's not whistling when you're doing this, leave it alone. Don't apply feedback reduction. Leave sleeping dogs lie. But of course, always do real ear to make sure that the hearing aid is actually doing what the software said it was doing. Okay, because real ear is the, really the best one. The now targets on real ear are the true now targets. The now targets on the software are sometimes different. The, if you have a fifth flat 50 dB loss, and then you just put that into NOAA, and then you look at the now target for that loss on Bernafon and the now target for that loss on Unitron, and the now target for that loss on Oticon, you might end up with three different targets. It's kind of like, the, you know, sometimes the manufacturers implement now in different ways, Ooh, which gets kind of hairy. The only true place that, that the only true believer, or the, the, the true one that hasn't sinned, is going to be the real ear. That's going to have the unadulterated, pure now on it. Because real ear is impartial. It just doesn't belong to any manufacturer. It's just real ear. Okay? That's why real ear is the verifier. Verily, verily.
Okay, that's the proof is in the pudding with, when it comes to real ear. But you have asked a good question. Does the fitting method affect the, 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 the feedback? And it really, well, if the fitting method is suggesting a lot of high frequency output, yep, you're going to be, what do you call it, flirting with feedback. Because high frequency output is what's going to cause feedback, especially peaks in the high frequency output. And when you use feedback reduction to get rid of the peaks, be careful, okay, because don't eat too much dessert because you'll get sick. You're going to throw it. It's not going to be good for you. You'll throw out too much high-frequency gain, and you want that high-frequency gain. So there's always a bit of a, a, of a tussle there. We can basically end today by a quick discussion about com compression combinations. And this is easy. We don't even need to spend much time here because we've talked about this in, in weeks before. So I'll just quickly go over this, and then what we'll do next week or next time we meet is we'll continue this particular unit, and we'll talk about expansion. We'll move on, but we'll talk about expansion, and that's the end of this particular unit. And then in two weeks from today, because remember next week is fall break, next uh, uh, we'll, we'll cover expansion, and then we'll move on into digital noise reduction. So you should make sure you print up your notes for the digital noise reduction for unit six as well. Okay, so next time we meet, which is two weeks from today, have this printed up and your next unit six, have that printed up too because we'll finish with expansion and then we'll launch into digital noise reduction. But for now, let's look at compression combinations in digital hearing aids today. Quite simply said, Okay, you will remember when we talked about hearing aids, we talked about knee points. Let's say here's a knee point. This is linear gain. This is soft inputs. And here's linear one to one. Here's WDRC two to one. Here would be a higher compression ratio. Okay, so you're just showing more and more and more compression ratios. Fine. Okay, so you can see that as the compression ratio, oh, look at this, my internet connection is unstable. Yeah, so is my sanity. Okay, so it, you can see that as your compression increases, you're going to be getting less and less gain. I mean, obviously, linear is going to be the most. If I'm looking at this input here, I got lots of output here. And if I look at this input here with a 4 to 1 compression ratio, I only get this output here. Okay, so it's obvious as my compression ratio increases, my, my output is, is decreasing accordingly. Now, this is one way of adjusting compression, but you could also adjust it this way. You could adjust it from the rightmost knee point. And when you're doing that, you are really more faithfully imitating the graph on the right. Look at normal loudness growth the red. For a normal hearing person, 20 in is soft. For a normal hearing person, 50 is comfortable. To a normal hearing person, 90 plus is loud. And then you take mild or moderate hearing loss, which is the light blue. For that person, 50 is now soft, and yet 90 or 100 is too loud. This is obvious. We've covered this lots of times. So if you want to make this blue line match the red, you'd think you'd be adjusting your hearing aid accordingly on the left. It, the models match. Instead of doing this, do this. Well, digital hearing aids did. They combine both. They just do both. So here we go. Here's, a, here's your knee point, threshold knee point. Here's a threshold knee point. And look at these. You've got linear to the left of this knee point. You've got WDRC for all moderate inputs in the middle. And then you have output limiting for, for, for loud inputs. So you're combining things first. Now look at this graph picture here accordingly. This is what we're not covering is expansion. We'll talk about that next time. Okay, leave that one alone. We'll just focus on linear WDRC output limiting. And now I'll show you the next picture here. Each of these knee points can be adjusted, it can be raised or lowered, can be moved leftward, rightward. And now your eyes are beginning to glaze, at least mine are. 
And so I can just tell you, take a chill pill because the software adjusts this for you. That's what's happening underneath the scenes. So no longer are you sitting there with a tiny screwdriver adjusting the compression ratio on the back of an analog hearing aid. Your software is doing it all for you, which is great. Now, there's a little bit of a, of a, of a new wrinkle as well. If we talk about what these things, so you can raise the knee point on the left. And look what's happening when you're doing that. Two to one. Five to one. Where do you think most gain in outputs taking place? If your if your if your your compression is hinging from this knee point, look at this. A low compression ratio is less gain in output. This is more gain in output with a higher ratio. Doesn't make any sense, but that's because you're hinging it from here. Mind you, if you're hinging it from here. Okay, then five to one is less, of course, and two to one is, is, is more gain in output. This is a less of a compression ratio. This is more of a compression ratio. So it just depends on where you're hinging things from. So digital hearing aids hinge from both. They play around. And now we'll finish with this slide. Digital hearing aids haven't ended there. Instead of having, let's say, two knee points, you're like this, instead of this, oh no, that's just too boring. Let's get more exciting. Let's have three knee points. So, now look at what's happening. And here's where we will end today, and we'll pick it up next time. Look at the green. This is linear. But here's linear again. So you're getting a knee point here, and then you're getting wide dynamic range compression for soft or moderate inputs here. But what is a common complaint at restaurants by people wearing hearing aids with the best intentions in mind? Oh, we're providing wide dynamic range compression to imitate the outer hair cells. We're giving maximum amplification to soft sounds and progressively less and less amplification for louder sounds. Great. I can now hear the people farther away in the restaurant better than I can hear the person across the table. How come? Because the voices farther away are softer. Well, WCRC is amplifying softer sounds by more, and it's amplifying louder sounds by less. So the guy sitting a yard away from you is louder than the people at tables that are further away from you. So here's WDRC amplifying the guy across the table from you less because his voice is louder and amplifying the surrounding tables more because those are softer. That's where this came up, okay? So what do digital hearing aids do today? And I'll give you a company, Oticon, for example. They call it SpeechGuard, trademark, SpeechGuard. And what is that? Providing linear gain once again for moderately louder inputs, 65 to 75, linear gain again. <laughs> okay? Makes sense. Just, it really does, with, with that being, you know, where yep. people are going to hear speech and stuff. Yes. So they're, that, so that's, what, that's what they've gone and done now. So now look what y'all gone and done. Okay? So now you've got linear for soft, really soft, and then WDRC for soft to moderate, and then linear, again, for more, okay? And then output limiting compression. So this green little section here is intended to address the common complaint. I hear people better at tables further away than I hear the person across the table from me. This is meant to address the common complaint found with wide dynamic range compression hearing aids. So compression today and today's digital hearing aid is a complex combination of all of yesterday's types of compression. 
compression began on analog hearing aids. It developed and it evolved on analog hearing aids. First was output limiting, then came WDRC, and WDRC came with the emergence of the knowledge of the outer hair cells and how we've got to amplify soft sounds by a lot and back off gradually. Digital hearing aids took all of that. They took the bill, the till, and they went, well, we don't need bill and till anymore because we don't have two channels anymore. That's stupid. Why don't we, why don't we just say multi-channel where we can adjust the gain completely so bill and till went bye-bye. And then we say, ah, oh, but now we can address that common complaint about restaurants and tables and further away. Let's combine all the types of compression, and all of them are being used in today's year in combination. So when you look at it, the hearing aid, it may look pretty simple, but inside you peel away the veneer and there's an awful lot of complexity going on in there. And you as a clinician are not sitting there adjusting each and every one of these parameters because I would like lose my mind in terms of the complexity. That's why we've got software. That's why it does it for you. But be very careful. I'd rather have a bottle in front of me than a frontal lobotomy. I would rather enjoy this cup of coffee than take this and go, eh, because if you follow the software blindly, that's what you're doing to yourself. You're taking off your frontal cortex and you're giving it to the manufacturer. Do not just push the hit the save button and go, healed, it's done now. It isn't quite. You, you, that got you in the ballpark. And you need the software, you have to have it in order to program the hearing aid. But now go to your real ear and verily, verily, does it say what the software said it was going to say? In, ver in truth, in vino veritas, in wine there is truth? Well, let's find out the truth anyway, okay? Find out what, what the hearing aid is doing. Anyway, so that will end today's session on hearing on digital analog hearing aids, digital hearing aids, what they are, what analog wasn't. We are now entering further into digital territory and next week we'll really more hammer down on, or next two weeks from now, expansion and digital noise reduction. Okay? All right. With that, adios. Have a good adios. one. All See right. you in two weeks. Yeah, take care of yourself. Okay, you too. All, All right, bye-bye. Right.